The tradition of eating corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day is relatively new, but the dish itself goes way back. So today we're making corned beef and cabbage as it might have been eaten in early medieval Ireland. So thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video as we celebrate St. Patty's Day with medieval corned beef and cabbage, this time on Tasting History. So finding a historic recipe from Ireland is really, really hard, and finding a medieval historic recipe from Ireland is downright impossible. But I did find a description of corned beef and how it was prepared in a poem from around the year 1100. It's called The Vision of McConklin, and I will talk about it in depth later. But in one scene, there is a feast with tender corned beef and honey in the comb and English salt. He rubbed the honey and the salt into one piece after another. That's really all that we have to go on, though he does say that it was roasted, but we don't really get a description of the whole process. So we'll probably boil it first, uh, because that is traditionally how it's done, even when it is roasted, just to get some of the salt out. And it's that salt that gives corned beef its modern name. Corned beef refers to the corns, or very large grains, of salt that are used to preserve the beef. Though in early medieval Ireland, they would have used something called sea ash, which is the product that's left over after burning seaweed. But as they do mention English salt in this recipe, in this description, I think we're okay to go with the more modern version of corned beef. So I'm going to use a four pound or two kilogram piece of corned beef, then a quarter cup or 85 grams of honey and a half teaspoon of salt. As for the cabbage, again, no medieval Irish recipe, but there is a medieval English recipe, and we know what ingredients they would have had available in Ireland at the time, so with that, we can extrapolate a recipe for Irish cabbages in pottage. Take cabbages and quarter them, and seed them in good broth with onions minced and the white of leeks slit and carved small. The recipe goes on to mention several spices that really weren't popular this early in the medieval age, but would have come around very soon after. But we're going to leave those out, but they did have pepper, so we will include that. So it's a little bit different from what we usually do because we are making two full dishes. A full meal, just like the ones that you would get from today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Making a meal with HelloFresh has become one of our favorite things to do on weeknights, mainly because after cooking all day for the show, or even just writing and researching for the show, I rarely want to go out shopping for ingredients, and really rarely just want to even think about what I have to make for dinner. But with HelloFresh, that's all done for you. It shows up onto your doorstep, the recipes are well laid out, and all the ingredients are pre-portioned, making the cooking process nice and simple you get all the benefits of having a home-cooked meal without the stress of planning. Last night, spur of the moment, I whipped up a dish of chicken and bacon-filled ravioli. I made a creamy onion and tomato sauce, and in no time, I had a meal that would have made my mama proud. And HelloFresh has so many options. Vegetarian, pescatarian, family-friendly meals, and recipes that are particularly quick and easy, which are the ones that I usually gravitate towards. So if you want to give it a shot, go to HelloFresh.com and use code TASTINGHISTORY16 for up to 16 free meals, plus three surprise gifts. That's TASTINGHISTORY16 at HelloFresh.com. Now, back to Ireland. So for the cabbage portion of this dish, what you'll need is one large head of cabbage, one large onion, two leeks, two cups of beef broth, one teaspoon of salt, and an optional teaspoon of pepper. So corned beef is always rather salty, but you can reduce the saltiness to an edible level by putting it in a pot of water and then boiling it for a minute. Then drain it and then do it at least once again. This is actually how they desaltified meats back in the medieval age, so it is appropriate. Then mix the salt into the honey and slather it all over the corned beef. Then wrap the corned beef in some foil and place it on a baking sheet or in a roasting pan and set it in the oven at 325 degrees Fahrenheit or 165 Celsius and you're going to cook this for about an hour a pound. So interesting note about corned beef is that its association with St. Patrick's Day is more of an American invention than an Irish one. See, while corned beef was incredibly popular in Ireland in the Middle Ages, its popularity eventually waned in favor of pork. Partly because cows take up a lot more room than pigs do, and they're a lot more expensive to maintain, but also because a lot of the good corned beef was being shipped across the sea to England. Surprise, surprise. So in Ireland, the dish became cabbage and bacon. Well, then in the 19th century, mainly due to the Irish potato famine, a lot of Irish people ended up immigrating to America. But in the neighborhoods where they tended to be, the butchers were kosher butchers, so they didn't have any bacon to give. What they did have was plenty of wonderful corned beef brisket. And so that's what the American Irish population began making on St. Patrick's Day. 
I'm guessing that they didn't realize that they were actually going way back to their old, old Irish roots by switching over to the corned beef. As for the cabbage, well, every place has cabbage, so that probably didn't really change. And to make the cabbage, you're going to quarter it, and then chop the onions fine, and chop the leeks into half rings. Then put everything into a pot, sprinkle with a little salt, and the pepper if you wish, and then pour in the beef broth and set it on the stove until it's boiling. Then reduce the heat until it's just simmering, and cover it, letting it cook for 20 to 30 minutes. And while it cooks, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe, I promise it'll give you the luck of the Irish. And let's go back to medieval Ireland, a time when cows dominated the landscape of Hibernia. Now when it comes to the cuisine of medieval Ireland, it can really be broken up into two periods, before the Norman invasion and after. And for our purposes, we will focus on the before times. A time of warring clans and kingdoms and of bustling Viking cities like Cork and Dublin. It was a fascinating time, but like I said, they didn't leave us any recipes. But that doesn't mean that they didn't leave us some wonderful writings on food. Because a lot of the poetry and the law books of the time had a lot to say about food because it was the cornerstone of society. Food was actually how many people paid their rent and what you ate determined your place on the social ladder. Or rather, your place on the social ladder often determined what you ate. Even the mythical cauldron of restitution on the Hill of Tara made sure to keep people in their place. Essentially, this cauldron was a never-ending bounty of food, and you would stick your fork in and pull out some food, so that no party ever went away from it unsatisfied. But even then, what came out was sufficient for the company according to their grade and rank. Yes, even a mythical cauldron made sure to keep everyone on their rung of the ladder. So let's start on the bottom rung. The bottom rung was actually seven rungs, seven different levels of peasant. And the law books were very specific on what everyone would get when food was being handed out. Now, everyone had the basic diet of grains, usually barley and oats, and dairy products, which they called white meats. And even the lowliest level of peasant was due their grains, milk, and cheese, but he is not entitled to butter. That's right, butter was a clear indication of where you fell in society. Did you get butter? How much butter did you get? And what kind of butter was it? There are actually stories of people showing off their wealth by buttering their bread on both sides, which seems a little excessive and frankly not very practical, but there it is. So no butter at the lowest rung, but as you move up, you do at least get some additional side dishes. A wooden mug 12 inches tall filled with thickened sour milk. And a full-sized loaf of bread, though the word loaf here is kind of misleading. It was probably more like a flat bread made of oats and barley. It was a foot wide, and a man's little finger measures it in thickness. Another rung up, and you received two loaves of a woman's baking. And if you were lucky, these might be made of wheat or rye. One legal text describes them as two fists in width and a fist in thickness. Another rung up, and you get five loaves and a choice of milk or butter, though the choice was not yours, but that of your lord or whoever was handing out the butter and milk. Also, this butter probably wouldn't have been much to write home about because the peasants were not entitled to fresh butter, but rather heavily, heavily salted butter for preservation purposes. Another way that they preserved butter was by making bog butter. Essentially, it was butter that was pressed into a wooden container and then buried in a peat bog, and even without salt, it would stay edible, if not maybe a little funky, for years. Now, these peasants had a lot of uses for butter other than just putting it on their bread. In one story, a Viking named Ingolf was desperately thirsty, but they had no water around. So his Irish slaves formed the plan of kneading meal and butter together and said it would quench his thirst. They called it Minitak. Though in the story, as soon as they make it, it ends up raining, and so he doesn't need it anymore. Though in other writings from the time, they talk about this mixture of butter and flour, or meal, being used as a roux to thicken porridge. It was also often put on bread, along with some salted onion relish. And the next level of peasant would get that onion relish, but only on Sundays. On other days, they would get vegetables and some form of salted meat, usually venison. Now, mind you, all of this is only when there was food to go around, because if there was a famine, and there was often famine, then the peasants were always the first to feel its effects. Great famine in the spring, so that a man would sell his son and his daughter for food, and men would even eat one another, and dogs. All land was almost emptied and scattered throughout Ireland on account of the famine. 
But provided you weren't starving and you were at the top of the peasant ladder, then you got everything I've already mentioned, but just more of it. Eight loaves of bread, salt on the side, onions, butter, and salted meat on the third, fifth, ninth, and tenth days, and on Sunday. And the meat started to vary. Sometimes it would even be fresh. It'd usually be venison, but goats and sheep and pigs were also available. Pig was especially popular during the festival of Samhain, and there was even a specific dish called the Piglet of Samhain. And in one 9th century love poem, a young man woos his lady love with a promise of pork. O oh woman, if you come to my firm folk, a crown of gold will be on your head. Fresh pork, ale, milk, and drink shall you have with me there, fair lady. Though the gold crown might be a little more enticing than milk and bacon, though I do love bacon, as did medieval Irish monks, though they preferred theirs wild. At the monastery of Tala, the monk Mulruin claimed that not a morsel of meat was eaten in Tala in his lifetime, unless it were a deer or a wild pig. Another interesting tidbit that the monk gives on their eating, or rather drinking habits, was what they were drinking, but also how they were supposed to drink it. See, they usually drank either ale or this whey water, which was just watered down whey left over from the cheese making process. But in either case, they were instructed to sip it. For a man finds less sensual pleasure and satisfaction in sips when he is thirsty. So no gulping your whey water while you enjoy your wild pig. And wild animals were on the menu for a lot of people, not just monks. Pine marten, badger, and boar were some of the most popular, as were a number of fresh fish, lamprey, and shellfish. Though the fishing rights in rivers was very closely guarded, especially by the church, so be careful where you go fishing. There was also a great deal of hunting with birds of prey going on, but again, you gotta be careful where you do it. Stay away from any lands owned by the nobility or the church. You want to stick to the land of the commoners, because if you do catch something, then the owner of the land is due one-fifth of the meat and two-fifths of the feathers, but you get to keep everything else. That's not a bad deal. So all of these law books that talk about what people are allowed to eat had multiple purposes. One, of course, as I said, was to keep people on the social ladder, but another was to lay out what you had to give a person to eat if you injured them. Basically, if you hurt someone, you had to feed them until they got better. And what you had to feed them depended on who they were, and there's a lot of talk specifically about if they were women. In general, a woman got half of what her husband would get, and a concubine would only get a third or even a fourth of what whosoever concubine she was got. And there were some women who, if they were injured, got nothing. These included a sharp-tongued woman, a vagrant woman, a werewolf in wolf's shape, an idiot, a lunatic. Big werewolf problem in medieval Ireland. Huge. Now, if you were sick, there were also some foods that you had to stay away from. No salted meat, no honey, no whale meat, and no horse meat. The law also dictated how you were to feed a pregnant woman, or rather, it just dictated that you had to feed a pregnant woman. One set of laws makes it very clear that if your wife is pregnant, you have to feed her or else you will be fined. And speaking of pregnant women in Old Ireland, there is a story in the 10th century Life of St. Patrick where a pregnant woman becomes ill and Patrick asks her to diagnose herself. Why are you ill, he asks. The woman answered, I beheld an herb in the air, and on earth I never saw its equal. And I shall die, or the child that is in my womb will die, or we shall both die unless I eat that herb. And just like husbands everywhere go out in the middle of the night to get pickles and watermelon for their pregnant wives, St. Patrick decided to placate the lady by magically turning the rushes into that herb, which depending on the translation is usually leeks or chives. Now once a lady gave birth, then you would take care of the child for a while, usually about seven years, and then you would give that child to another member of the clan that you were in to raise and educate. It was done as a way to keep the families close together. It was a system known as fosterage, and along with the child, you would send some cows. If you were a farmer, you would send three cows with your son or daughter, and if you were a king, up to 18 cows. These cows could then produce an income which would be used to take care of the child in fosterage and to feed the child, and of course, what the child was fed depended on who they were. The base diet for your average kid was known as the soft fare of fosterage and included the yolk of eggs, butter, curds, and gruel. Though again, not all the butter was equal. Common children got salted butter and noble children got fresh butter. They also usually got some honey. 
but fresh butter and honey was just the beginning for a noble child because once they grew up, things got real good. Instead of salted meat, nobles were due fresh meat, at least from Samhain to New Year's. The rest of the year, it was kind of a toss-up, usually salted meat, simply because cows with their milk producing capabilities were so precious that you didn't turn them into meat until you absolutely had to, no matter who you were. But even if you did get salted meat, as a noble, you also got honey, fresh garlic, and an unlimited amount of celery. Now, just like peasants, nobles had a strict hierarchy as well that was also shown in the food. Uh, one would be simply how close to the king you got to sit when you were eating, and the other was the higher up on the nobility ladder you were, than the higher up on the cow your meat came from. A king might get rib or tenderloin while the royal doorkeepers got flank and shank. Now, a fair amount of what we know about royal food at the time actually comes from this poem, the one that our corned beef description is from today. It's about a scholar named McConklin who finds himself the guest of some monks in Cork, but the monk's hospitality is lacking. They give him a small cup of the church way water and two sparks of fire in the middle of a wisp of oaten straw and two sods of fresh peat. So naturally, he mocks this meager ration, and the monks, not ones to take criticism well, decide to crucify him for it. Literally crucify him. But the night before the crucifixion, he has a dream or a vision from God of a land filled with food. A boat formed of lard takes him across a lake of milk to where he sees a fort, with works of custards thick beyond the lock. Fresh butter was the bridge in front, the rubble dyke was wheat and white, bacon the palisade. The place was surrounded by streams of beer and mead, and there was even a well of wine. And he goes inside, and the columns are made of cheese, and all of the people are wearing cheese and tripe around their necks, and the king is wearing a mantle made of beef. And that king was Cahul McFingan. Well, the bloodthirsty monks realize that this vision somehow is what is going to cure the real king, Cahul McFingan, of the demon that's inside of him, the demon of gluttony. So they release McConglin, and McConglin goes to the king. But the king, only able to think about food, isn't paying attention to him. Until finally, McConglin grinds his teeth against a stone so loudly that everyone, including the king, has no choice but to pay attention. And it reminds me of that scene in Jaws, where Quint scratches down the chalkboard. I'll catch your gluttony for you, but it ain't gonna be easy. Bad demon. Not like going down to the pond and catching lust or envy. And it wasn't easy because even after he got his attention, it took McConglin a long time to get the king to even share an apple. But it was the first time that the king had shared any food in three and a half years. The next step was to get him to fast for a couple days. And then he makes a huge feast with roast meat and then ties the king to the wall and tells him about this vision of the land of food that he had until the lawless beast that abode in the inner bowels of Cahulmafengen came forth until it was licking his lips outside his head. Gluttony falls onto the ground and McConglin takes a cauldron and puts it over him and tells everyone to evacuate the castle. Then he lights the place on fire, but the demon escapes and goes up to the roof. But McConglin has one final trick up his sleeve. He reads the gospels to the demon and gluttony goes to hell. So if you have any friends that are possessed of a demon, the first step is to get them to share an apple, then a couple days of fasting, and finally make them a wonderful dish of medieval corned beef and cabbage. So 30 minutes before your corned beef is done, open up the foil and then raise the temperature of the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or about 205 Celsius just to let the top darken up a bit. And once it does, it and the cabbage are ready. And here we are, medieval corned beef and cabbage. It slices up so nice. Also, I wanted to thank Akiva from Metalwork by Mayola, who made me this gorgeous custom knife. Uh, he is a fan of the show and reached out and said, hey, do you want a wonderful custom knife? And I said, yes, and he made it. It's amazing. It can cut pretty much everything. I think it's gonna be my main knife from now on. And I'll put a link to his Instagram uh, in the description if you wanna check out what else he does or get yourself a custom knife. Now let's get to this corned beef. It smells delicious. I mean, it, it smells like corned beef, but that honey really, like, there's this almost burnt honey smell, but in a pleasant way. Um, I'm excited to try it. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's good. That's good. 
Super different from a modern corned beef because honey, I feel like is not something that is usually mixed in with corned beef. So you get the saltiness of the corned beef and a lot of times they'll add like brown sugar, but that is a very different flavor. This is honey and salt and corned beef. Uh, it's really wonderful and the texture is fantastic. Just, just falls apart. Kind of a little chew at the beginning and then it really just falls apart. It's gonna be perfect for sandwiches this week. Now the cabbage. Hmm. I mean, it's cabbage. It's not, it's not super complex, but it also has the leeks and the onion in there, which give it a little bit of, a little bit of heat. Um, so it does kind of add something, some depth to it, but it's okay that it's, it, it's not too complex because the, the, the meat is. So together they go really well. So whether you have medieval corned beef and cabbage or not, I hope you have a wonderful St. Patty's Day. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and I'll see you next time on Tasting History.